Hello everyone, welcome back. In today's video I finished the legendary Cold War fighter the MiG-21. In 2022 I visited an aviation museum in Solnok, Hungary. This was the first time I saw my favorite MiG-21 PF in real life. It was highly inspirational so I decided to build it. The kit is a profi pack from Edward in 1 in 70 second scale. In my previous video I already built an upgrade cockpit set. If you want to watch it, just click the link on the screen or in the description below. The plastic parts in the kit are fantastic, highly detailed even on the smaller scale. As far as I've seen, this is the best MiG-21 in 1 in 70 second scale in the market. I started the build with the wheelbase. They are not the most exciting wheelbase that I have ever seen, we can't really add extra details to them. Never mind, the parts from the kit are already well detailed, all we have to do is put them together and paint. Let's speak a little bit about the history of the MiG-21. The MiG-21 is a supersonic jet fighter designed by Mikoyan Guryevich, the famous Russian design bureau. Since the mid-50s they built more than 13,000 aircraft. This is the most produced supersonic military jet in aviation history. Except for Australia, it served every continent, around 60 countries and some of them are still in service. After World War II, a race started to reach supersonic speed and later overcome Mach 2. Soviets needed a fighter that could fly twice of the speed of the sound and could operate as an interceptor and as a tactical fighter. The design concept of the MiG-15 reached its limits in the MiG-19 model, so MiG designers had to start something new concept. Airflow studies were conducted that three wing designs capable of Mach 2 or higher speed. The first option was an ultra-thin straight wing arrangement, the second option was severely swept wings, like the MiG-19, and the third option was a delta platform with swept leading edge and straight trailing edge. At the same time, in the western part of the world, the American Lockheed company designed the F-104 Starfighter with an ultra-thin straight wing design. In France, the Dassault company designed the Mirage, a tailless Delta aircraft. Both of these aircraft were Mach 2 capable fighters, but Russian designers came up with something else. MiG worked with Sagi and they tested all the options and finally calculated that the Delta platform produces much less drag than swept or straight wings. Generally, the thinner the wing relative to its width, the less drag it produces. The Delta design is very wide at the fuselage and its relative thinness is much greater than other wing designs. The solution was the 57 degree Tagi 59 Delta wing profile supplemented the Delta with tail section, horizontal stabilizer to increase the maneuverability performance of the fighter. Because of the shape, the designers called it the balalaika, after the famous Russian musical string instrument. The Tumansky engine sits deep in the fuselage, not really visible. I painted the turbine blade silver and weathered them with deep brown. I primed the afterburner chamber in black and lightly painted over with bright green. I recommend gluing the resin cockpit into the fuselage in two parts. The side panels and the back wall should fit perfectly. It's easier to glue them separately. For gluing the resin parts I used Gear Super Glue. The early prototypes were swept wings configurations, like the MiG-19, but they couldn't provide the desired performance. Only the fourth prototype had the balalaika shape, supplemented with the tail section. Basically this shape remained the same with minor changes for decades. Its maiden flight was on the 26th of June 1955 from the Zhukovsky test airbase with the test pilot Grigory Sedov. The early flights weren't successful, but with the more powerful Tumansky R11-300 jet engine, it could finally reach Mach 2 speed. Another interesting element is the regulated inlet cone in the air intake. At high speed the cross section of the intake cannot accept the increased airflow and it causes air intake stall. In the early prototypes the intake spike was fixed to smooth the airflow, 
However, split cones 2 or beyond Mark II, the cone wasn't effective. Designers modified the spike to be adjustable. It interacts with the airstream, smoothing the airflow for the engine. For the first time the world could see this fighter in the middle of 1956 at an air show near Moscow. The NATO designation of this new mysterious fighter became Fishbed. The serial production started in 1959. We can speak of four generations of MiG-21. More like five, but this is for later. Now I won't tell all the sub-variants because it would take forever, just mention the important milestones. The first generation was the F and the F-13 models. The F was a pre-production model exclusively for the Soviet Air Force. This model wasn't fitted with underwing pylons, only two 30mm cannons with 60 rounds of ammunition per gun. The F-13 was the first model to build in larger numbers. It had an increased vertical fin, fitted with only one 30mm cannon and two Wimpel K-13 Atoll air-to-air -air missiles under the wing pylons. It was installed with the improved SK-1 ejection seat, the latest autopilot, radio compass, radio altimeter and all the fine Russian technologies that existed then. The F-13 was also built under license in Czechoslovakia and China. Both of the Czechoslovakian and Chinese version were slightly modified. The Chinese version was called J-7. The exhaust nozzle in the kit is quite thick. With a half round shape file it is easy to make it more realistic. I made two rings inside the nozzle from thin copper wire. The second generation, my personal favorite, is the P, PF and PFM models. These models featured a number of modifications to improve the all-around performance of the fighter. The nose inlet section was enlarged in a diameter with an extra 220mm and added a radar antenna in it. The dorsal spine behind the cockpit was also enlarged to make room for extra fuel and the separate rear portion of the canopy was deleted. The 30mm cannon was also removed, only two underwing pylons remained for two missiles. The PF received a new, more powerful Tumansky R11 F2 300 engine. The production of the PF started in 1962 in Gorky. This is my ultimate favorite MiG-21. I really like the shape of the spine and the vertical fin. For my taste, this is more graceful than any other model. The last model in this generation was the PFM. This version was delivered to East Germany. The one-piece canopy was replaced with the windscreen and the main canopy opened to the starboard side. The ejection seat was upgraded to the more advanced MK1. This ejection seat was a 0-0 model, which means you could eject from zero altitude and zero speed. The vertical fin was widened for battle stability. In this model was introduced the blown flap system. From the engine's compressor section, Compressed air was ejected over the upper surface of the flaps when the flaps were lowered. This new modification highly improved the takeoff and landing characteristics. The PFM still had no internal gun, only two wing pylons. All around the engine, small intakes on the fuselage. I drilled them out gradually with thin drill bits. I started with a needle up to the required size with 0.1 mm steps. The two large intakes forward cool air to the afterburner, while the two smaller ones on the top serve the nozzle actuator of the engine. Lovely little details. This was the first time I used Vallejo's plastic putty, and I really liked it. It's a water-based and with a wet cotton swab, easy to remove excess. It's perfect for small gaps, but for large gaps I would use grey putty or epoxy putty.
I started the paint job by cleaning the surface with isopropyl alcohol. I wanted to paint the grey silverish tone according to the original aircraft I saw in the museum. I didn't want to create a shiny metal finish. Instead of black, I used Mr. Surfacer grey primer. Because I liked the grey tone, I didn't paint it over with grey paint. After the primer, I fixed the errors and then I smoothed the surface with ultrafine sanding sponges. My favorite metal paints are the Mr. Color SM series paints. A bit expensive and not too many tone variations, but the metal particles in the paint are super fine. Check how much finer than the Tamiya paint. With white and black paint, it's easy to change the tone. That's how I mix darker shades. So after the grey primer, I overpainted the surface with extra thin super fine silver. To make the surface more interesting, I used various tones like dark iron or titanium, again in super thin layers. The aircraft that I choose to build had quite a unique history. It was built in May of 1964 at Gorky with the factory number 760409. It started her active service in August 1964 at Tossar Air Base. In the following years the aircraft was used for nothing but practice complex training flights day and night from low altitude to the stratosphere. On the 14th of July 1966 during a low altitude training flight there was a cabin fire and the pilot had to execute an emergency landing. After the incident, there was an extended four-year-long standby in its service. In January 1970, the aircraft was back to active service. During the industrial repair, Russians upgraded many parts of the aircraft, which made this machine unique among the Hungarian PF fleet. It wasn't a standard PF anymore. Ten years later, in June 1980, during an overhaul, this aircraft was the first three-tone camouflaged painted MiG in the Hungarian air fleet. This is the paint scheme that Eduard offers in the box. Sandy brown and dark green on the top and the belly is light blue. Unfortunately all the paints Eduard recommends are not really close to the original tone. MRP has precise paints for the Hungarian Air Force camouflage. MRP 351, 352 and 353 the three colors. Mr. Color RLM65 is quite similar to the belly light blue, Mr. Color Sandy Brown is also close to the actual tone, and Tamiya's XF27 black green is also useful for the green tone. I wanted to paint this MiG-21 the grey silverish tone, so I didn't use these paints. After 1970, the next 9 years weren't too glorious for the Hungarian PF aircraft, because other more modern variants like the MiG-21MF or MiG-23 or the Sukhoi-22 dominated over the PF's abilities. On the 1st of January 1989 the whole Hungarian PF fleet was retired from active service. However, the story of the fall night did not end here. In the mid-1990s, this very aircraft was the test bed of the new Hungarian insignia. At the same time it had the original communist era star and two other markings. Finally in 1991 all the Hungarian aircraft received the new insignia, similar to the 1938-41 period tricolor chevron. At in the end here's a little bit of statistics of the 409. She flew more than 1800 hours with almost 2900 landings. During its service is used 7 Tumanski engines and 18 pilots flew this aircraft in the Hungarian Air Force. It was industrially repaired 3 times and due to minor repairs another 46 times. Never fired an air-to-air -air missile. For training purposes it dropped bombs 2 times and fired UB-16 4 times. Luckily this aircraft was never used in combat situations.
Edouard's decals are excellent. It was a pleasure to apply them. However, according to the pictures, the stars in real life were a bit smaller than the decals. If you have a chance, maybe use aftermarket stars. After the endless stencils, I fixed the surface with multiple layers of matte varnish. Matte varnish was a perfect base for weathering. I used highly diluted oil and animal mixtures. I built the desired tone step by step in thin layers. Basically the PFM model led to the next, the third generation of the MiG-21. Reinstall the internal gun and add the two extra under wing pylons. The whole aircraft gained weight and size. From the many third generation MiG-21s I highlighted the MF and the SMT variants. Because of the increased weight of the aircraft, the designers intended to lighten the airframe. They used alternative materials such as titanium alloy. The MF was also upgraded with a new lightweight Tumansky R13 300 engine, a new radar, and the internal fuel capacity was increased to 2650 liters. In the same years, the MiG-23 became available in larger numbers, so many of the MiG-21 were transferred to ground attack units. Because of this, designers upgraded the weapon system with ground attack weapons such as bombs and air-to-ground missiles. The MF was built from 1970 to 1974 and remained in combat service up to 1992. The last third generation MiG-21 was the SMT. Designers rearranged the fuel tanks so the dorsal spine became larger and fatter. The enlarged spine unfortunately negatively affected the flight characteristics of the aircraft and pilots didn't really like this variant. Only a small number of SMTs were built between 1971 and 1972 exclusively for the Soviet Air Force. An interesting fact that the SMT was capable of carrying nuclear weapons on the fuselage center pylon. Another interesting model from this time frame is the MiG-21i model. In 1970 this model was used as a test bed for the design of the supersonic airliner the Tupolev 144. The MiG wings were replaced with the scaled down 2144 wings for test purposes. Only two prototypes were built. Unfortunately one of them crashed during a test flight and another one after the test was retired to a museum near Moscow. The last, the fourth generation, was the MiG-21 BIS. This aircraft was a completely new design, however, externally it looks very, very similar to the MF model. The main goal was to optimize the new aircraft for low-level combat. MiG redesigned the internal structural airframe of the aircraft, using a lot of titanium versus the heavier steel elements. The new MiG received all the new avionics from the MiG-23, and installed the new Tumansky R25-300 engine with an improved afterburner system. The only visual difference from the MF is the wider and deeper dorsal spine. The production of the MiG-21 was closed in 1974 and the production was focused on the more advanced MiG-23M. A trainer version of the MiG-21 was needed because the last trainer aircraft was the MiG-15 UTI. There was no trainer version for the MiG-17 or the MiG-19. The first trainer was based on the airframe of the MiG-13 model in 1960. The second cockpit was replaced in tandem style, reducing the fuel capacity. The internal gun was also deleted from the aircraft. It was the MiG-21U, NATO designation Mongol. Only three variants were built from the trainer models. When the PF was introduced, MiG modified the U to the US model 
to make the internal similar to the second generation mix. Change the ejection seat to KM1 and added a useful periscope for the rear pilot, which automatically activated when the landing gear was released. The final and the ultimate version of the trainer was the UM. This model was upgraded with the third generation MiG-21's equipment and electronics. Later the engine was also upgraded with a lighter and more powerful R13300 from the MF model. Now here is why I said 4 plus or 5 generations of the MiG-21. After the production ended in 1974, the aircraft was still in active use for a long time. Maybe even today somewhere on the planet a Tumansky engine is still roaring. In the mid-90s India decided to modernize the Indian Air Force MiG-21 BIS models. They chose 125 BIS and in a few steps they upgraded them to the MiG-21-93 Bison. During the modernization they rebuilt the whole airframe and upgraded all the electronics and avionics system. The original engine, the Tumansky R25-300, remained the same, but its performance was reduced. Mech 2 is less critical nowadays. Because of the reduced performance, the service life of the engine was improved. As part of the modernization, the airframe structure underwent complete structural repairs and reinforcements. The canopy was enlarged to make better all-around visibility. After over 20 years of service, the Bison wheel completely retired in 2025. Indian Air Force operated the MiG-21 for more than 60 years. In 1992, Romania started to modernize its MiG-21 fleet. The project was basically the same as what India did. Upgraded all the electronics, avionics, engine and airframe to meet modern standards. During the modernization, three versions were developed. 75 MiG-21M aircraft were optimized for attack and reconnaissance tasks. 25 MiG-21MF were modernized for air defense tasks and 14 MiG-21 UM two-seaters were built for training purposes. A total of 114 aircraft. The modified machines were named as Lancer R. The R is probably refers to Romania. All Romania MiG-21 aircraft were retired from service in May 2023. The Profipack contains a canopy mask, which is quite useful because the one-piece canopy is a curvy shape. Unfortunately, the mask is only for the outside of the canopy. So if you want to keep the canopy open, you should paint the inside. Therefore, you should cut your own mask for the inside. I use the outside mask as a reference to cut the inside one. Because the thickness of the canopy cut the inside mask a bit smaller. You only need a glass ball, a head torch and a new sharp hobby knife. Over the past decades, the MiG-21 has been used as a tactical or an interceptor fighter in many conflicts. Starting with the first generations of the MiG-21s, they took part in conflicts in Asia, the war between India and Pakistan, the Vietnam War or in the Middle East. One of the biggest advantages of the MiG-21 in dogfight is its small size. It's not easy to see it over a mile, especially if it's pointed directly at the enemy. The enemy won't be able to see it within a mile. In the Vietnam War, Vietnamese pilots used this advantage of the MiG and scored many aerial victories over the US Air Force and the US Navy. America had to change tactics and training to change the kill ratio. The MiG-21 was also extensively used in the Middle East conflict in the 60s, 70s and the 80s by Iraqi, Syrian or the Egyptian Air Force. In the Yugoslavian war in the 90s, the MiG-21 was used mainly in ground attack roles. During these decades, several pilots earned the A status flying the MiG-21. Vietnam People's Air Force pilot Nung Van Ko, who achieved 9 kills flying the MiG-21, is considered the most successful pilot of the MiG-21 history.
I made a new pitot tube from metal tubes. I used 0.3, 0.5 and 0.8 mm sizes. I believe it's more realistic in this way. There was a black ceiling paste between the canopy frame and the plexiglass. I used oil paint and a very pointed brush. The advantage of oil paint is that if you don't like the result, it can be completely erased from the surface for a very long time. This is another lovely kit from Edward. It was absolutely a joy to build it. You don't have to use extra detail sets if you don't want to. The kit itself is just fantastic out of the box. If you like this Cold War era Soviet supersonic jet fighter, this kit is highly recommended. If you like this video, I would really appreciate it if you liked or considered subscribing to my channel. If you click the little bell, you won't miss any future videos. Please share my videos with your modelers friends and leave a comment, let me know your thoughts. Thanks for watching and see you next time.